Hi, uh, this is uh, Philip Martin, and uh, this is the second uh, of these on film columns that I'm doing as videos uh, for the Arkansas Online website and for Blood, Dirt, and Angels, uh, my blog, and uh, maybe we'll be a little bit more focused, a little less uh, meandering this time. But I don't know. That's kind of like that's part of the charm of doing these things is that you sort of go off on rabbit holes. Uh, I don't have anybody to bounce things off of, so it's <laughs> it's sort of interesting. I'm starting to do this thing on the um, on the bus 1037 high FM here in Little Rock um, with Justin Acre and Wes Moore uh, on their show The Zone. Um, where I'm going on at 12.30 every Friday, and we're talking about some aspects of movies and stuff like that. Uh, and um, I've done a lot of radio over the years. I kind of enjoy it, because radio is one of those weird mediums that, you know, sort of lives in your head, and it's a real intimate media. But it's a very different audience, I think, than I have in the newspaper and than I have on, on these things. Uh, but anyway, it's it's it, it, it's kind of nice. But anyway, we started. This is actually Justin's idea, um, so I have to give him credit. And he was talking about, well, why don't you do what the Oscars would be like if 2020 wrapped up like it did, and there's no more movies in theaters for the rest of the year. What would be the um, the nominees, and what would be the, uh, the winners in various categories. And if you pay attention to to what I do, you know that I don't really have a whole lot of, uh, I don't spend a whole lot of effort on the Oscars every year. I don't generally make serious predictions. I don't generally talk about it in a serious way because it's not a serious thing to me. I think that uh, what a movie critic does is different than what somebody who forecasts the Oscars uh, does than what somebody who you know goes on uh, TV and entertains people talking about entertainment does. I still consider myself more a critic than any, any of those other guys. I don't pay attention to the Oscars because it's it's fun and I don't have anything against them. Like a friend of mine said, well, it's like our Super Bowl. Well, I can I can get that. It's really a lot of fun to invest a whole lot in something that means absolutely nothing. Now the Oscars don't mean nothing. They mean a lot to the people that win them and to the people that get nominated for them. And they can make a career. Uh, they can, you know, uh, buy you some clout. But I'm not covering the business of Hollywood, so I don't really pay attention. I just want to write about the movies that are on the screen. And I just want, really just want to use the movies as an occasion to write about what I want to write about, if I'm absolutely being honest. But anyway... We thought that was an interesting, you know, experiment. And what what are you going to do uh, if you all of a sudden, you know, your movie season is truncated, your year is cut off? Uh, about 50 movies made it to the theaters in um, 2020. Someone said I didn't count them up, but that's what uh, I read someplace where maybe there were 50 uh, films that actually got in theatrical release this year. And if you think about it, there's a rhythm to the year. Now, what we see in the first part of any given year is like in January and even into February, you're still seeing a lot of films that were made in 2019 and that got, you know, some sort of token release in that year, that calendar year, so they would be considered for awards. Uh, there's still opening in some markets, especially a market like Arkansas, like Little Rock. Um, we, you know, the the best movie that's opened here this year, as far as I'm concerned, is Portrait of a Lady on Fire. But I actually saw that movie back in October, and I, you know, I consider it in my voting for the 2019, you know, awards. Okay, so let's take those things off the table because a lot of those do sneak in in January, February. Um, a lot of the big Oscar you know, kind of uh, seeking movies, at least, show up around that time anyway. And then you have a certain species of movie that opens in January and February that is sort of like, well, we don't know what to do with this movie, but we're going to release it and get it 
just get get over it. Just get it out of our system. Horror movies, throw them against the wall. See if they make a little money. Uh, misbegotten projects by major stars sometimes. Remember Mordecai from a couple of years ago, the Johnny Depp vehicle opened, I think, in January or February. Um, and then, you know, in March, April, you start to see better films coming out. And sometimes you'll see something like an Us or a Get Out. Those are two films recently that have been very good films that have opened in the first quarter of the year. And every year there's a couple in the first quarter that have some ambitions and that the studios have ambitions for. Uh, but you don't really get the best movies or what the studios consider the best movies this time of year. So I thought about it. I said, well, okay, if that's what they want me to do with radio, I, I, I prepared this list. And thinking about this list even more now, because it's been a few days since I did that segment, um, you know, maybe it's it's worthwhile thinking about this stuff because we're in a different environment now, and I don't know that we're ever going to go back to the old environment where, you know, you have a movie that comes out every week that sort of dominates most weeks. Most weeks there's one obvious movie that we're going to put on the cover, the, the leads part of our, our, our movie style section. And, um, and sometimes there's two or three that, they're, you know, you can... But, but generally, this time of year, there's one movie. And then there's a bunch of smaller movies that don't get a whole lot of oxygen because the bigger movies kind of take up all the space in the cultural conversation. And what we're seeing now is that we have, with the environment the way it is, with the way things are coming out now, the studios have pulled back all these big superhero movies, all these big, you know, would-be star vehicles, these big budget movies, and they're holding them, you know, off until they can actually put them in theaters, which they think maybe a month, maybe two months, maybe three months, who knows. And it's given some of these smaller films uh, a chance to breathe. And so we're paying attention to things that we wouldn't be paying attention to normally. Or at least my, my point is, you guys are paying attention to things that you wouldn't be paying attention to normally because it's my job to pay attention to uh, the Whistlers and the Assistant and all these mid-major movies that, that come out. And that, you know, I kind of, are, are generally my favorite kind of movie. I mean, I'm not a, a big superhero fan. I'm not a big franchise fan. You know, I... I'm, I'm just not that. And what we've seen in the past, I don't know, 20 years or so, is we've seen more than that, which really goes back to the 70s and to, to Jaws. And when all the studios started adopting this Earl Weaver kind of idea about the three-run home run being more efficient than the uh, hit-and-run and scratch out a run here and there uh, strategy in baseball, they started to discover that you can make a lot of money with a big hit and if you throw everything into the you know you just just swing big and you don't have to worry about hitting the singles because in the end you'll you'll be better off well that's fine from a business point of view but from an artistic point of view we still crave movies like the conversation movies like dog day afternoon movies like kramer versus kramer movies that um you know, are more human scale and are about people and they're people sized. And a lot of that in the past 20 years, especially since the advent of streaming services, uh, first it was they went to HBO and Showtime to an extent, and now they've gone to, you know, Netflix and Amazon Prime and stuff like that, which means it's great if you stay home and watch movies or stay home and watch these long form episodic um, TV series because there's a lot of great stuff to watch and I could talk about that all the time and one of the things we started to do a few years ago in this part of the newspaper was talk about you know some of those things some of those uh, things that were on TV non TV yeah see uh, for a lot of us we still think of a movie as something you go to see in a specific place and sit in strangers sit with strangers in the dark and watch it on screen 
Now, for a lot of younger people, a movie, they're sort of platform neutral. They can watch a movie on their phone. They can watch a movie on their iPad. They can watch a movie on their uh, computer, on their TV. It doesn't really matter. But we're still... I still see a place for those the theatrical things. I really hope that doesn't go away, even though this current um, situation has sort of uh, made it clear that it could go away. I mean, uh, I think some theaters are going to close. I think that AMC is going to have some problems. Um, so we'll see what happens. But anyway, back to the, the whole Oscar thing. It's a nice way of kind of showing you what kind of year we've had so far. And it hasn't been a terrible year. I mean, none of the films I'm going to talk about, I don't think, would actually get uh, an Oscar nomination in a normal year. But on the other hand, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that the Oscars are certifiers of quality either. I mean, I don't believe that. Uh, so anyway, I just am going to go through this the way that I want... You know, I, I think that maybe it's it, for once it makes it rather than start it from the bottom and, and, and lead up. I'll just I was thinking about what might get nominated for Best Picture if the Oscars were today, and you know we can nominate up to ten pictures. Um, the Academy has strange ways, and we're not going to even try to uh, describe how the voting works here or why you get nine some year and seven nominees another year. But we just said, let's have seven nominees. Seven nominees. Okay, here are the nominees. And these are all films that opened in 2020, real 2020 openings, not 2019 holdovers. And I guess they all, not really, no, they didn't all actually open theatrically. Because I don't think Never Rarely, well, Never Rarely sometimes always did play at Sundance. I don't know if it actually played in a, in a commercial theater. So let's just take that off the board. These are all 2020 films. Okay. And here's what I come up with. This is my, my seven nominees. The first one, Birds of Prey. Mainly because I wanted seven nominees. And I think it's at least an interesting development. You know, it's, it's sort of a, an interesting twist on the superhero genre, that whole Harley Quinn, Margot Robbie thing. Uh, not a terrible film, but a problematic film in some ways. And it gets in, you know, Lots worse films have been nominated for Oscars, I'll tell you. The second one's a, a slam dunk, Emma, period. I don't know what the period's for, but it's Emma, period. Costume drama, not costume comedy, really. Um, period. And, uh, you know, Anja Taylor-Joy, or Joy Taylor. What is it? Taylor-Joy. It was Taylor-Joy. See, I actually got it right the first time. You know, it was wonderful in this, and she's a bright young thing to watch. Um, First Cow, which I know nobody probably has seen that. I think it's on Netflix, though. I'll have to check. Let me see where Net Look, this is. Let's try something in real time. Where can you see First Cow? Kelly Reichardt's First Cow. Let's just Google it up here in real time, which is bad um, vlogging or whatever, but um, let's see. First Cow, you can see it. It's A24 film. Where can you see it? You can get tickets. You can free order. All right. Okay. Maybe you can't. I thought you could see this on Amazon Prime or... Uh, let's try where to see it. Where to watch. Okay, here we go. It's flipping around here. You can watch it on Amazon. Okay. Uh, I think you have to rent it. No, you can't watch it yet. You can pre-order it. Okay, so, yeah, First Cow. Um, Kelly Rockhart's one of my favorite directors. Very slow-moving. Very <clears throat> quotidian subject matter. But it's, you know, I, I'm, I'm not going to spend the whole time 
talking about how much I love Kelly Reinhardt. And, yeah. The Invisible Man, Elizabeth Moss. Wonderful performance, problematic movie. Uh, Never, rarely, sometimes, always. Uh, the abortion movie from Sundance that uh, stars what's her name, Sydney uh, something, um, Sydney Flanagan. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Karen, my wife, reviewed this. I watched it. It's a it's a very good film, very well made film, very um, much from a point of view. Uh, also, another one of those movies that's uh, going to strike some people as not a movie because it's uh, keyed really low and is very naturalistic. The Quarry, which I wrote about last week, which actually I think is a very good film, and I liked it. I uh, thought there were two really good performances in it. The script may be a little underbaked and a little bit leaning toward... Um, Bernie Toppin territory, if you know what I mean. It's like hints at a profundity that's not quite there. Um, but it's worth it for Michael Shannon and Shea Witham. And, um, okay. Uh, and The Way Back, which is Ben Affleck in a really, really good performance in a really average film otherwise. But it's a really, really good performance, and it's a performance that a lot of people can relate to, a movie a lot of people can relate to. All right, I'm not going to tell you who I would give the Oscar to here, but those are the nominees. Now let's go. Best Director. Best Director. Best Director always directs the best film, doesn't it? The best film is always made by the best director. That's what I used to think, and sometimes I still think that. Uh, I'm going to nominate Scott Teams for The Quarry, mainly because... I met Scott Teams at the Little Rock Film Festival a few years ago. He's a nice guy. He did a wonderful film uh, in 2009 called um, Bad Evening Sun that starred Hal Holbrook and Ray, Ray McKinnon, who's worked with uh, Scott. Scott was a writer on Rectify. Um, Rectify, yeah, Rectify, uh, Ray McKinnon's uh, TV show that I've talked about so much. Eliza Hittman, who did Never, Rarely, Sometimes, Always. My one of my one of my favorites, Ken Loach, uh, the British director, the socialistic, you know, um, <laughs> dish, uh, uh, just kitchen sink realist uh, from England. Sorry, we missed you, which is a really interesting film about. Uh, uh, Newcastle family uh, struggling in the wake of the 2008 financial crisis. So it's a real uplifting story. Yeah. Um, Kelly Riker for First Cow and Lay Flannel for Lay One L for The Invisible Man because I needed something else. And that's. <sighs> That's an interesting movie. I mean, it's the way it was put together and everything, and the idea behind it. And let's just throw something toward it here. Best actor. Well, let's. Who's our best actor? I think you have to recognize Harrison Ford in Call of the Wild. I think you have to recognize John Magaro, who none of you know, who was in First Cow. Liam Neeson for Ordinary Love, which is the perfect title for this movie, which is should have been just like Ordinary Movie. Uh, it's about... Um, it's, it's really well acted, though. I mean, um, Liam Neeson and Leslie Manville from Phantom Thread are an old married couple. They are retired, and she gets sick. And this is a story about how she gets sick and what it does to them. And Liam Neeson is really good in this uh, as in a role that's very different than the sort of roles he's been ta taking on recently. It's not an action hero role at all, but he's very good. So. Um, and I'm going to say Will Smith, Bad Boys for Life. It's the best of that series. Bad Boys for Life and Will Smith is really good at it. Okay, <laughs> moving on. Best Actress. I, I could dress this up. I could have, you know, titles and stuff running underneath this, but I'm not going to spend all that time doing it. Uh, best Actress, Julia Garner for The Assistant, which opens today, or is on 
Amazon Prime and Netflix are it's on it's on I think it's iTunes and Amazon Prime where you can rent it today and it's a very good film it's about 87 minutes long it is uh, a day in the life of an assistant to uh, an unseen movie mogul who resembles in his behavior Harvey Weinstein Sidney Flanagan, who is a musician who is doing her first acting role, and I think she's like 19, she plays a 17-year-old in uh, Never Rarely, Sometimes Always, who has to travel from her Pennsylvania home to New York City in search of an abortion, and she carries her uh, cousin, 17-year-old cousin along with her, who I'm going to nominate for Best Supporting Actress, but we'll get to that in a minute. Elizabeth Moss. The Invisible Man. She's really good in this. Like I said, it's a problematic movie. Not very... I'm not sure I would have even given this movie... A... I didn't review the movie. I'm not sure I would have even given it a positive review had I reviewed it, but she's really good in it. Issa Rae in The Photograph, another not-so-great movie, but a solid performance. And Anja Taylor-Joy for Emma, which was a delightful little slip of a movie. And I'm leaving out Margot Robbie for Birds of Prey, though that's the, that was the one that didn't make the cut. Okay, so. All right. Now we're really scraping the bottom of the barrel. Best Supporting Actor. Well, ladies and gentlemen, Jim Carrey, Sonic the Hedgehog. I'm just going to let that lay there. Hugh Grant. In the gentleman we could also have matthew mcconaughey in the gentleman and but 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 no we're not going to do that michael shannon for the quarry michael shannon's a wonderful actor he just and he's great in this it's just, he's this small town lawman and he's just just great it's just really uh lakeith uh, stanfield in the photograph and Bill Nighy and um, we could actually have him for Hope Gap, but actually it's it's Emma that uh, I'm nominating for. Okay, last category. Then we'll go back, circle back around to what the best picture of the year so far is. The best supporting actress, uh, Talia Ryder, is the name of the other girl, and um, rarely, sometimes, rarely, never, rarely, sometimes, always. That's not a good title either. Um, and now, Janina Gavincar for The Way Back. She plays Ben Affleck's wife, Angela, in that. She's a good performance, but in a regular year, no. I mean, none of these things. But, um, uh, Mia Goff and Emma, and she plays the naive young Harriet. And uh, that actually... That's really good. She could, in a, I don't think it's a Florence Pugh type thing. Not like Florence Pugh and Little Women last year, but it's a, it's a, it's a good role for her. Leslie Manville for Ordinary Love, which could actually be, you can make a case that that's actually an actress performance and not supporting actors, but I'm not going to get into that because we don't get into that. I just leave those things to the studios and the academy and all that. And Mary Elizabeth Winstead for Birds of Prey, just because I've always liked her. And let's go back and give away the Oscars now. And we'll do this really quickly. Best director, Eliza Hittman. Never, rarely, sometimes, always. We needed, I mean, it's, it's, it's not a weak field exactly, but it's not... A really strong field, and looking at this, that's probably the best movie of all these. The Lo the Ken Loach movie is really good. We could have given it for, to Ken Loach for a lifetime achievement sort of thing, or we could have given it to Kelly Reichert, but then we'd be giving it to a movie about a cow. Okay, best actor? I think Ben Affleck, and I honestly think so. I honestly think that's the best performance I've seen this year. I was going to give it to, to Elizabeth Moss until I actually saw Julia Garner in The Assistant. So Julia Garner gets it. Julia Garner is Ruth in Ozark, if you didn't know that. Supporting actor, Michael Shannon, The Quarry. 
Best Supporting Actor, Actress, who cares? Who cares? Talia Ryder, I guess. Sure, never rarely, sometimes always, I really enjoy her performance. I thought she was a, yeah, I think she's great. I think Mia Goff was great too, and so was Leslie Manville. So. But Talia Ryder gets it because I just said her name first. And now for the big one, the picture of the year. I am really torn. Okay, we're going to give it to Quarry. The Quarry. We're going to split the... Because uh, because I could have given it to Never, Rarely, Sometimes, Always. But then that would be like, you know, I'm giving it to the... I, ju I just wanted a little bit more balance than that. So it's a... That's that's the best of the year so far. But the thing is, this is just we're, we're going to get plenty of plenty of product, plenty of things that are going to end up either in movies, houses, or on your TV screen before the end of the year. So don't despair of that. Um, we've got so much stuff that we can't get it all in a newspaper, um, and it's really kind of an interesting dynamic because I thought we'd be really trying hard to find stuff to put in the newspaper but we're really doing well with this stuff so and as far as um, everything else we're holding up um, I'm up here in my office I've been here a lot the sun's shining out there I'm gonna go out there I'm gonna walk around I'm gonna stay six feet away from everyone and maybe in a few weeks, a month or so, we can all come out and, you know, have a party or something. Anyway, take care. We'll talk to you soon. Uh, remember all the social media stuff. The um, at Bork Dog is Twitter. Uh, the Facebook thing. The, uh, <laughs> the Blood, Dirt, and Angels blog. Uh, and, of course, the Arkansas Democrat Gazette. Thanks all.